everyone. Welcome again to another video of our fabulous series with uh, my dear brothers, um, David Wood and Sam Shamoon. And uh, if you've been really following the previous uh, uh, videos, uh, you would know that we have titled this particular series Scripture Twisting 101 intentionally because we've been talking about verses that our friends, Muslim friends, tend to take out of context for whatever reason, sometimes just to try to prove a, a theology that Muslims want to be convinced about that, for instance, Muhammad is in the Bible, uh, or the Bible is corrupt, and uh, sometimes they try to prove to us that Jesus is not divine, and so on and so forth. So every video, we did it intentionally to handle one verse at the time. Today's passage is from Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, and it reads as follows. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. David, I thought Christianity is a religion of peace. Yeah, well, uh, you have an interesting situation in the world. We have uh, terrorist attacks pretty regularly going on in the world, um, and there doesn't seem to be an end to it. And so, naturally, when there's a terrorist attack, you, you want to get to the bottom of it. You want to understand the terrorist attack. And when you start looking into Islamic terrorist attacks, you end up going back to the teachings of Muhammad. And uh, you end up going back to the Quran, and you find the Quran ordering adherence to violently subjugate unbelievers in the name of Allah, including Jews and Christians. You find Muhammad saying that he has been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah. So we want to point to the text and say, in order to understand jihad and to really confront the ideology, we have to deal with the Islamic texts. Right. But there are lots of people who don't want us to do that, to take that route. They don't want us to take the Islamic text. So I'm, I'm not just talking about Muslims here. I'm talking about there, there are many non-Muslims who don't want us going that route. They think you might hurt someone's feelings, and that would be bad. <laughs> uh, so the, the natural inclination of uh, many people is to say, well, there's violence in the Bible, too. Right. Now, of course, there is violence in the Bible. There, there is you, know, you have the con conquest of the Canaanites and so on. You have violence in the Bible. But our, our, our claim isn't that there's violence in the Quran, right? In, in that sense, there's violence in, in any history book, right? Uh, a, a book on World War II would contain far more violence than you find um, in, in, let's say, the Quran, as far as the actual battles that took place. It was much more, much larger scale. Right. Um, so you can't just say, well, you know, hey, but there's violence in the Bible, too. What you would want to say in order to make, uh, to make the two cases really parallel is that the Bible is advocating violence. The Bible is advocating, calling for violence towards unbelievers in the same way that the Quran is, is advocating or calling for violence against unbelievers. And therefore, mm -hmm. Christians would, would be hypocrites in condemning um, what, what the Quran says about violence, and we, we should keep our mouth closed. And maybe atheists can bring things up, but, but, but not us. Um, now, the problem is, um, you, you can't simply turn to a command to Joshua to fight the Canaanites or something like this and say, here's what the Bible is uh, commanding Christians today to do, because that was a command to Joshua, right? That, the, 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 the Mosaic Covenant was tied to a piece of land and involved taking and seizing that piece of land and then maintaining that piece of land against enemies who, who would attack. So there was violence there. But that's not a command to Christians, right? I've never met a Christian who said, you know, I need to cross the River Jordan and fight the Canaanites because it's in the Bible. I've never, I've never seen a Christian who said that. Christians, I've never met a Christian who would be that dumb because you have to recognize there are commands that are directed to certain individuals. There are commands that are directed to certain groups in the Bible um, that aren't necessarily directed towards you now today. The commands that are directed towards us now today, it can be certain, certain moral commands, like love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and so on. You can find that the, things like that are in the, old, the, the general moral commands like that. Right. Um, but as far as uh, the main commands that would be directed towards us as Christians would be the commands associated with the teachings of Jesus and his followers, because these are the, the teachings most clearly associated with the new covenant. And so we would ask, where are we as Christians, as part of the covenant that we are under, the new covenant, where are we committed, commanded to violently subjugate unbelievers That's right. in, in, in any way? And people have basically come up with two. Uh, in a separate video, <laughs> we look at 
Luke 19, 27, which is even weaker than the one we're about to look at. And this one is really weak. Um, but the, uh, the, the, those are the two main ones. These are the two commands that people have been able to show where Jesus is supposedly calling for violence. So Jesus, if you take it out of context, uh, of course, <laughs> of course, it, it, it always is. So Jesus here says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword, right? Ah, you, you Christians are calling Jesus the Prince of Peace and saying, oh, he's all about love. He's all about peace. And yet what happens when we actually read the text? He specifically says he hasn't come to bring peace. He's come to bring a sword. And so obviously Christians are being commanded to wield the sword against unbelievers and to violently subjugate them in the name of Jesus. So right. that must be what he's commanded here, um, as long as you ignore everything else in the chapter and everything else Jesus said. You could, you could come to that conclusion. That tends to be uh, what, uh, what people do. Now, there, there are two main approaches here that you can go. Uh, one, I don't think that Jesus is talking about physical violence at all in this particular verse, because uh, as we'll see when he goes on, he's talking about families being divided. And so it looks like what he's saying is, uh, his teachings, much like a sword divides things, uh, is going to divide families. Going to, you know, father's going to be set against the son and so on. Right. Um, and the, the parallel, the parallel in Luke would, because you, ha you have the parallel sayings in, in, in uh, Matthew and Luke, and the, the parallel in Luke uh, 1251 would seem to indicate this because he doesn't say, uh, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. He says, I've not come to bring peace, but division, right? So he, even Luke understood this as meaning dividing people. As a, as a right. sword divides things, his teachings are going to um, actually cause division. Um, and so when, when, you, when you read what he says, it's not, I've not come to, uh, do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword for you will go out and hack people up. Mm -hmm. He says, for I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. So families are going to be divided. Um, is this talking about Christians going and killing their family members and stuff like that? Well, again, only if you completely ignored everything else Jesus That's right. said. So I don't personally think that, that right here is talking anything about physical violence, but there, there, there is a, a, another perfectly valid interpretation here where he is talking about physical violence. He is talking about a sword that is going to be hacking people up. But if you read the context here, Christians are on the receiving end of this sword. And so the meaning in context would be, hey, you guys, think, you, you, you guys are convinced that I'm the Messiah here. And you're convinced that because I'm the Messiah, we're going up and I'm going to take over and I'm going to bring you peace and destroy all your enemies. But guess what? You're not getting peace here. You're not getting peace. You'll have peace in a spiritual sense. We, we, we have that, of course. But as far as what you're getting in this world, you're getting the sword, right? Right. So, uh, it, and you can see this in the exact same chapter, right? Because this is the chapter where Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. Uh, two by two on their own, right? So they're not with him. Now he's actually sending them out to preach. And right after he sends, the, he sent, as, he's the, as he's sending them out to preach, he gives this advice. Starting in verse 16 of the same chapter. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now notice, I'm not, he's not sending them out as wolves to go out and devour the That's sheep, right? right? To go out and, 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 and kill as a wolf would, would devour, right? They're on the receiving end. They're the sheep in this, in this story. It says, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in the synagogues, and you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them to the, and the Gentiles. So is this Christians bringing people into court to have them judged, to have them beaten, to have them executed? No, this is unbelievers doing this to Christians, to followers right. of Jesus. That's right. It says, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother, now remember the, the, the family, the family analogy, right? I mean, when, when, I mean, when, when he's talking about family, right? Setting family right. members against each other. Brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father has child. And children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you, and notice you're not the persecutor here. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. 
A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So if Jesus is going to be brutally tortured and crucified and a student is not above his master, guess what? That's what's going to happen to you as well. And that is what ha happened to his followers historically. Um, and that's still happening to his followers today. So if this passage is referring to the sword, well, look at, look at the context of who is doing the killing here, right? He, he even speaks in the context of family members rising up against each other and having them killed, having them put to death. So when he says just a few verses later, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword for I've come to set a man against his father and daughter against his mother. They were, uh, Christians were not the family members who were killing their own family members. Christians were the ones who were being killed by their own family members because right. they believed in Christ. So even if you, if you want to go with that route where he's actually talking about violence here, Christians are on the receiving end of the violence. And so again, the message would be, hey, you're convinced that I'm the Messiah and you all, they, were, they would all have been convinced, all his followers would have been convinced that he's going to bring them peace. He's going to go out and, and destroy the enemies. They're going to reap the benefits of that. And then he's telling them, no, you're, you're actually going to get the sword. And I mean, think about this. I mean, his own, his closest followers, his closest followers, the overwhelming majority of them died horrible, bloody deaths, not by killing others, but by being killed, yes, um, which Jesus promised them. He promised them that kind of persecution. So uh, that, that's what happens when we just examine the passage itself in context. When we say, okay, here's the verse. Let's read the surrounding verses. The immediate surrounding verses just sounds like he's, he's, he's go I'm going to divide families. Families are going to be divided up. Um, if you want to look at the, the rest of the chapter, it's about Christians being persecuted at the hands of others. There's no indication that Christians are going to be committing any sort of violence. But if you, ha if you said, if you sat back and said, okay, here, here are two possible, notice over and over again, you go to a verse where you say, oh, I could interpret it that way, or I could interpret it this way. You go with the interpretation you want, instead of asking a very simple question, well, I could interpret this verse as it stands on its own in two different ways. Let me see what else Jesus says to decide what he really means. Yep. Notice that's never how it works, right? Over and over again in the verses that Muslims use, we see this, this principle that you go to the ambiguous verse, a verse where you could say, huh, Jesus said he's come to bring a sword. Well, he could mean a literal sword that his followers are going to use to hack up. You wouldn't know what he means by the verse alone. He's either he's talking about a, a sword that his followers are going to bring in his name and subjugate other people, or he means something else. Christians are going to be um, uh, on the receiving end of this sword, or you know, uh, he's just talking about families being divided and so on. What does it mean here? Well, what you would do is go to other passages where Jesus says clearly his view of physical violence in his name. That's what you would do. And you say, oh, now this tells me exactly what this passage uh, really means. So uh, Matthew chapter five, for instance, verses 43 to 45, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and That's pray right. for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Not a lot of going out and killing them. Notice that's the same book as well. That's so right. that happens, that happens before, that happens before um, Matthew 10, 34. And then after 10, 34, when one of Jesus followers actually tries to use a sword, this should be the clearest verse. If That's you're, right. if you're thinking of, of what Jesus is commanding about whether you should be using physical violence, the clearest case, uh, would be when one of his followers actually pulls out a sword. And if there was ever a time to defend Jesus with physical violence, this was it. This is when they're coming to capture him, right? If there was ever a time in all of history when it would be the right thing to do, uh, to use violence to defend Jesus, to fight in his name, it's when soldiers are coming actually to, cap to capture him. And what happens, it's Matthew 26, soldiers come uh, to capture Jesus. Peter pulls out a sword, strikes a servant of the high priest. What does Jesus say? Good job, Peter. You're, you're starting the war like I want you to. No, he says, put your sword back into its place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. He tells him, put your sword back. The only time one of his followers actually uh, pulls out a weapon to hurt other people. And he says, stop it. 
And one, one more verse, um, John 18, 36, because this sort of uh, sums, every, sums up his view. So Jesus in, in, um, uh, in, in John 18 is being questioned by, by Pontius Pilate. Pilate wants to know what Jesus did to make people want him dead. And Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So he specifically says that his followers do not fight in his name because his kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. It's not like, like other kingdoms where you would go out and fight for it. So if Jesus is saying his kingdom isn't an earthly kingdom, that you would fight for his kingdom and fight for him, if one of his uh, followers pulls out a sword to use the sword to, uh, to, to attack another person, he says, put your sword back in its place. If these are the clear passages where Jesus shows his true view of fighting, for, uh, attacking unbelievers in his name, um, even, when, even in self-defense, because they're, they're, com they're coming to get Jesus and they're still not allowed to defend him. Right? So if that's his view there, then how in the name of common sense can you say Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, where he says he's come to bring a sword, even though the entire context is about Christians getting the sword, Christians being on the receiving end of the sword, Christians being put to death by the sword. That's what the passage is about. This is really telling Christians to go out and, and kill everyone else. And apparently the disciples didn't get that message because they never did it. Right. So uh, that's the problem with this verse. And once again, over and over again, same thing, same strategy. Go to an ambiguous verse. Ignore everything else that refutes your interpretation, but still give it uh, an interpretation that fits with Islam. And our counter strategy is to read it within context. And the context, by the way, sometimes includes the whole book, just like David did. Uh, if you pick it up from Matthew, then in Matthew itself, sometimes you find the answer. And don't think like Matthew wrote it, uh, Matthew 1, Matthew 2. No, he didn't write it that way. It was just a scroll. That's what he wrote. And that's why we need to sometimes learn how to use the book itself sometimes just to refute the argument that is brought uh, before us. Hopefully, you'll find this strategy very helpful in your ministry. And we encourage our Muslim friends who are really seeking, uh, maybe you're being misled, you're told, uh, told this by your imam, by your friend, by somebody, maybe you're fascinated by some of these guys that claim to be apologists. Nevertheless, take the time for yourself to research it and understand that the argument is totally different than the way you are trying to present it. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash Sierra International.